Proudly, we hail. New York City, where the American stage begins, here's another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your army to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story is entitled, Hepzibah the Bugle. Master Sergeant Jimmy Klein remembers the story of Hepzibah as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our first act curtain rises in just a moment. But first, here's a special tip to you high school graduates. Something to think about. When you're making plans for your future, look into the future that our United States Army can offer you. Do you want real technical training? Our modern army runs the greatest technical schools in the world because a modern army needs hundreds of kinds of technical skills. Radio, radar, electronics, maintenance of engines, and delicate optical equipment, and many others. You can get this kind of training under the Army's Reserved for You training program. Ask about it at your local United States Army recruiting station right away. And now, your United States Army presents the proudly we hail production, Hepzibah the Bugle. Master Sergeant Jimmy Klein, infantry, completing 30 years of service tomorrow. I'll stand up there beside the colonel wearing all my lettuce, ribbons to you, taking the salute from the whole regiment. Well, I've got a civilian job lined up already, but I know I'll never completely get away from the Army. I'll be around somewhere helping somehow. The Army's in my bones. It's kind of hard to remember that I've finished 30 years. Here I am, only 47, hard as a rock, tougher physically than some of the kids just coming in. What do I remember? Reveille in the morning mist, retreat formations in tropical sunshine, and friends. All over the world, I have friends. But retreat, that was when I met the Bugle. Retreat formation in California during maneuvers in 1950. Let's see, I called the company out. They came out of their tents fast. Hold it. All right, make it snappy if you want to get into town tonight. Gerard, where's Gerard? He's got permission to get treated, Sergeant Klein. Poison Ivy. I thought everybody knew how to identify Poison Ivy. We had a whole hour on poisonous plants. At ease. A retreat's not retreat without a bugler. Anybody here can play a bugle? Well, come on, there must be somebody. Sergeant... Jackson has a bugle. That's so, Jackson? Well, I, I don't like to play my bugle, but I'll give a try at the company bugle. Get up to Corporal Gerard's tent and get it, Jackson. And I hope you know the difference between retreat and reveille. Oh, for Pete's sake, don't mix them up. We don't want to start the day all over again. <laughs> That was my first meeting with Jackson, a big kid from Virginia, the backwoods of Virginia. He was tall and good looking and had a grin wider than a 105 howitzer. That day he played retreat like he meant it. It was the same retreat that I've heard thousands of times, but it was different. After the formation, I hurried after him. Private Jackson. Yes, Sergeant? Word with you. You're quite a bugler. Well, I have played bugle a couple of times. Would you like to take over the bugler duties while Corporal Gerard is getting over his poison ivy? I reckon I'd like to. Well, just so long as I don't get taken from a real job, Sergeant. I'm a machine gunner, and that's what I want to be. You'll be getting up a lot earlier than the rest of the men, but I'll make sure you get time off to make up for it. One thing. How come you don't like to play your own bugle? Oh, well... I just didn't want to. Well, that's your business. The Army supplies a bugle for the purpose. 
How are you on the other calls? Miss, Tattoo, all the others. Well, I knows them all, Sergeant. <laughs> and some you ain't heard of. <laughs> that I doubt. I almost dismissed the whole thing from my mind. We were on maneuvers and I had rations and blankets and blank ammunition and fatigues and what not to worry about. Jackson proved to be an excellent bugler, even though he kept with his machine gun crew. And he was an excellent machine gunner, too. He took pride in being a good machine gunner. He set a battalion record for fast disassembly and assembly of his gun in the blindfold contests, and he was strong. He could tote the gun and tripod from position to position faster than anyone else. Yes, PFC Jackson was a good man. I was happy to recommend him for corporal, and he got it two weeks after I put his name in. Then the bottom fell out. Started innocently enough during a routine inspection. I was with Lieutenant Walker, the company commander, when he inspected Corporal Jackson's tent. Tail it! A neat tent. Neat area, Corporal Jackson. What's that bugle doing on the tent pole? Why... If you've got one laid out with your equipment, why two? This old one, sir, it's mine. The other one is army property. Well, you better send the old one home. We're about ready to move out of here, and extra gadgets add to the weight. After the maneuver, you can get it back if you want to. Hey, Lieutenant, I, I sure would like to keep this with me, sir. Huh, sorry, Corporal. Some of the other men had to send back radios, guitars, phonographs, even though they were willing to tote them, too. Corporal, we'll be slogging across some pretty rough country soon. Every pound will start feeling like ten pounds. Sir, I'm willing to tote extra stuff if you let me take the bugle. I'm sorry, Corporal. I can see that this battered old bugle means a lot to you. But I can't make an exception. It wouldn't be fair to the rest of the men. I'm afraid you'll have to ship it home. Yes, sir. I think he'll realize after a couple of days of climbing hills with a heavy pack and an army bugle that he doesn't miss the old one. I don't know, Lieutenant. I didn't like the look in his eyes. Yeah, like a man who's just lost his best friend. Check with me later, will you, Sergeant? He's a good man. I don't want him unhappy. I went over to see Corporal Jackson as soon as inspection was over. I guess every old-timer like me thinks he knows human nature. Thinks that he knows the type man will be a real soldier. Jackson was acting like a spoiled kid. I decided to do what I could for him. Okay, what's troubling you? I got Hepzibah all wrapped up. Come again? My bugle. I have her all wrapped up and ready to go. Well, I'm sorry about that. I... Sergeant, look. Could you keep Hepzibah in with the company records or supplies? Oh, I'm chock full. I'm traveling light, too. I just happen to know that you're shipping a whole box load of records out, right? Right. Oh, I get it. One of the field cabinets will be empty. You want me to truck Hepzibah in there? Look, Sergeant, that cabinet was pretty heavy. Now it's empty. Hepzibah just weighs a little bit. Uh, I guess I won't be exceeding any weight allowance. Oh, and I'll carry the cabinet. Oh, no need for that. That's part of the stuff that goes on the trucks. Corporal Jackson? Yes, Sergeant? It's a little irregular, but we can do it. Only thing, if I get sent records or records pile up, Hepzibah goes. It's a deal. Sergeant? Yeah? You've got a heart under all those stripes. Oh, scram. And I really had a good soldier. Corporal Jackson couldn't do enough for me or for the company. They saw that I'd done the right thing. Maneuvers drew to a close, and Corporal Jackson and his crewmen did a great job. They managed to infiltrate the aggressor lines with their machine gun and a bag of ammunition. The umpires ruled that they'd shot up the enemy command post. This pleased the lieutenant no end. Jackson was his boy then, and I was happy to see Jackson's name at the top of the list for men recommended to sergeant. And one day, the lieutenant came into my tent. He came for a friendly chat. At least I think he did. Busy, sergeant? No, sir. Well, maneuvers are just about over. The company's had a good shakedown cruise. Now, I guess we can start thinking about organizing teams. Baseball, football, basketball. We ought to have pretty good teams in all the sports. All the men are in top shape, anyway. That's always a big help. Mm -hmm. Say, I, uh, I noticed you've been lugging this box around. Thought we'd emptied that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did, Lieutenant. Well, there's no use carting it around, then. Or 
morale purposes, Lieutenant. Uh-huh. Well, I guess I didn't forbid you to use the empty box for storage, did I? No, sir. And Jackson did get rid of his bugle, didn't he? Yes, sir. So I guess there's no disciplinary action needed? No, sir. Uh-huh. Well, I guess there's only one thing to do. Yes, sir. B Company has official permission to carry Doughboy. The dog, sir. Right. C Company has Charlie the raccoon. I guess we'll just have to adopt this bugle as the official company mascot. Ah, yes, Jackson and Hepzibah. Little did I know right then how important Hepzibah was going to be. The most important thing in our whole company, in fact. After Lieutenant Walker decided that Hepzibah would be the mascot unless the company complained, all was peaceful and quiet for a while. The maneuver ended, we went back to our post and settled down to garrison living. And then it happened. I had a caller, Sergeant Murphy. You mean to tell me that we have a mascot? Well, we did on maneuvers. It's never been ruled out. I think we can change over now to something alive. Corporal Jackson has Hepzibah back now. That dented bugle? Oh, heck, the company wants a dog. We even got him named already. Muzzle Blast. Hey, good name. Well, suppose you go ahead and get him. The lieutenant will go along. Yeah, it's kind of important we get him fast. I just heard on the news that war broke out in Korea yesterday. I expect we'll go. We're in good shape and up to strength. In Korea? Right. We'll go, all right. Maybe soon. You better forget about the dog. We need a mascot. If we move out fast, a dog will get lost in the shuffle. You better wait till we get there. There ought to be millions of dogs in Korea. Yeah, I hope you're right. Hey, Sergeant! Sergeant, did you hear the news? Just did. We might go fast. We're ready. We sure are. Just off maneuvers. Then I can play Hepzibah. I haven't played Hepzibah yet. No, you haven't. But if we go over, I will. Well, good. Very good. Those were my very words. Good, I said. Very good. I had other things on my mind. A battered old bugle was the least of my worries. I didn't know that in a few months we would be in Korea, at grips with the floods of men coming down from the north, trying to sweep us into the sea. I didn't know that Hepzibah would be with us all the time, hanging around Jackson's neck. I didn't know that Hepzibah would come into her rightful role and would save the entire company. You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production, Hepzibah the Bugle. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. If you're of service age, I'm sure you'll be interested in the reserved for you training program of your United States Army. This program is filled with opportunities for young men of today who want to equip themselves with a top-notch skill and serve their country at the same time. Here's how it works. You make application at your nearest United States Army recruiting station, at which time you state your preference of a training course. There are more than 150 courses from which to choose. Now this application does not place you under any obligation to enlist. If you qualify and a vacancy exists, you'll receive a letter of acceptance that is your guarantee of a reserved seat in the course of your choice. Then you can enlist and begin your career as a skilled specialist in the United States Army. If you expect to serve a tour of duty in the near future, make sure you make the most of your opportunities. Visit your nearest United States Army recruiting station and talk it over with the friendly people there. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. Now we present the second act of Hepzibah, the Bugle. Those were the busy days, the days after we learned that American troops were already in Korea. Too few of them, but fighting hard to slow the onrush of the commies. There was a new atmosphere around my company, too. Men walked a little straighter, talked a little quieter. The soldiers knew without talking about it that we were going to do the job for which we were trained. Now all of America looked at us to stop the flood. Now we were going to show America that her trust in us wasn't misplaced. Corporal Jackson went around with a grin on his face. Hepzibah was going to go into action. At least that's what he said, and I was too busy to figure out the puzzle of Hepzibah the bugle. I made everything ready and sat back, figuratively, till I got the word. When it comes in the Army, Comes fast. Orderly room, eight company, Private Jenkins speaking. Right here, sir. 
Sergeant Klein. Telephone. Yeah. Sergeant Klein. Right, sir. We can, sir. I expected it. Round up the platoon sergeants. We're moving out. We just came off maneuvers. That was practice. This isn't Korea. Ah, yes, we were a cocky bunch. It wasn't that we didn't know what we had to do. It was just that we'd come off a maneuver that had showed us how to fight, what to expect. We knew we were going to climb mountains, big mountains, one right after the other. But we just climbed mountains. We learned a few tricks. Some of us had been in Korea before. That helped. In the Army, old soldiers passed the word around, so... And though we knew this wasn't going to be a maneuver, we were cocky. Soldiers who have gone overseas into a combat area carry memories through their life. Everything is vivid. Everything has an added sharpness because it's being etched by history. The soldier's every move is writing history because upon his actions, multiplied by those of his fellow soldiers, lies the fate of his country. My regiment landed in Korea and immediately moved inland. Our experience in moves like this counted. Every soldier knew his job and everybody did his job. We moved up in truck convoy, over the roads that were already rutted, through the villages that were almost empty of people, through the fields that were deserted of all except the very old. Then we came to the mountains, and we went up them until the trucks could go no further. Well, this is the biggest little old hill I ever did climb. But Hepzibah feels like a ton now. Hmm. Why don't you tuck her away? She'll beat you to pieces swinging like that. Nope. She'll stay right here. Hepzibah's coming into her own. I got the feeling we'll never know this story about that piece of brass. I got the feeling we will, Sergeant. Well, here comes the lieutenant. All right. All right, men. Now, you'll be under enemy observation when you reach the crest of this mountain. Right, sir. The company we're relieving is just on the other side. They've dug in, more or less. Well, good luck. See you there. forget how glad they were to see us. They were tired, those men. The commies had been too strong. They forced the other company back. Just as night came, A Company moved in and the other company moved out. Right away, I didn't like our situation. There we were, just off the top of the mountain. Across from us was another mountain. Connecting the two was a narrow gully. I remember, I asked the lieutenant about it. He didn't like it either. Yeah, I know, I know. You mean that draw between us and B Company on the other mountain? It's like an open door, mm -hmm. inviting them to pour through and get us from behind. It's too quiet. Well, Hepzibah's ready. What are you doing here? Supposed to be looking down into that valley. If they come up, but I won't hit a thing unless I'm right down there. He's right, Sergeant. But, Lieutenant, if we spread too thin, we can't stop and They'll find a weak spot and pour through. Yes, there's too much ground to cover. Too few men to cover it. Have you talked to B Company? Yes, sir. They say that they're covering a battalion front with company strength. They don't want to send men down into the draw. Well, the captain I relieved says that they try one point after another. I just have to outguess them. That's the signal. They're attacking. It's right smack into us. Jackson, get back up here with your crew. And Hepzibah, too. Wow. That's the way I feel. I never saw a man come in clumps like that. Now, if I was only a mind reader, will they try us again? Will they try B Company's mountain, or will they try the draw? We've only got a squad in there. They'll smash right through that squad. Sergeant! Sergeant, it's time for Hepzibah! Oh, of... Jackson and Now, hear him out, hear him out. The machine gun has saved us that time. Come on in and keep your voice down. Well, sir, the idea just hit me. We're glad that that's all that just hit you. <laughs> Thank you, friend, first, Sergeant. Do I have about five minutes? Well, you've got until they attack again. Sir... As I see it, they're liable to just come from any place. That's just about it, any place. Now, eventually, they're going to be where we're not. Then we've got to pull out so that they don't encircle us. Sir, Hepzibah is ready. Oh, pipe down about that, Hepzibah. Your machine gun will help us, and I think you'd better get back to it fast. Well, I thought I had a good idea. Go ahead. Go ahead, Corporal Jackson. I'll make it fast, sir. Well, you see, Lieutenant, and you too, Sergeant Klein, you've been nice to me, both of you. Don't think I don't know how nice. Sort of humor in me. You see, well, Hepzibah's the only thing we got left from great-grandpa Jackson. He was a bugler boy, he was, with the rebels, Confederates. 
May I go on, sir? Go on, Jackson. Get it off your chest. If they start firing, just skedaddle. Oh, that I will, sir. Like I was saying, this old Hepzibah is the only thing we got of Grandpa's dad's thanks. He, uh, great-grandpa, carried old Hepzibah through the whole war between the states. One night, just before the war ended, great-grandpa Jackson was with a company that was all shot up. They were running away, and a major was trying to stop them from running, but he was shot dead, the major was. And great-grandpa saw it happen, and he got mad. He stopped, and he began blowing. He began blowing Hepzibah. He sounded the charge, and then he sounded the attack, and, and he kept on and until some boys in gray, they stopped. And they looked at Great Grandpa standing there, blowing his heart out. They're prowling around B Company. Go on, Jackson. Well, more and more men stopped and looked at the kid blowing the charge. Then they did turn around and make a stand. And by golly, they stopped the Yankees cold. I think we understand what that bugle means to you now. They brought great-grandpa home, badly wounded. He carried Hepzibah with him. And he said, he said that nobody was to blow Hepzibah unless it was against an enemy of America. That's what he said. And he said that any Jackson that went to war should take Hepzibah and carry her always. My daddy carried Hepzibah in World War II. He got in a peck of trouble for it, but he carried her. So now we know. Well, your great-granddaddy will rest for your work tonight. Yes, he will indeed. Well, now, my idea, sir. I want to blow Hepzibah. You what? I heard them trumpets out there. After they blew them, well, they came right at us. That's their signal. And it's one of them for sure. And I noticed that they came from near where the bugle sounded. I think the officer in charge has the bugler with him. Might be. So, sir, let's lead them right into a trap, hmm? Let me crawl out there someplace and sound the charge like great grandpappy did. Only this time, I'll be getting the enemy to charge. But it goes along with what great grandpappy said. And I'll be the first Jackson to blow Hepzibah since my great grandpappy did. Jackson, this is, uh. I want you to know that I appreciate this. Now, wait a minute. If they come charging up that draw, and B Company has moved down onto one side, and we're on the other, we can... We'll wipe them out. Oh, that's what I'd like to do. You know, you might not come back. Lieutenant, I'll get back. I won't start until I find a place where I can't get hit from the side. Oh, from the front. We want you back. Now, I've got to sell this idea to battalion. I'll go back myself. Sergeant Klein, take the company. I'll get back as quick as I can. <laughs> The lieutenant went back and I stayed and checked the company. The men were dug in well and they were resting like good soldiers always do when there's no firefight. In a way, I hated the thought of sending them down the slopes of the draw. It was rocky and we had no cover. We'd need to go way down to have effective fire. And if the enemy crossed us up, didn't follow Hepzibah's call, we were ruined. They'd be above us using our positions. For a minute, I was sorry the lieutenant had gone to battalion. Then Jackson stuffed a piece of cloth in Hepzibah and blew a few notes. <laughs> he had it. It sounded just like the commie bugles. Maybe, I thought, just maybe it had worked. Then the lieutenant was back, worn out from the climb. Captain from B Company was there. Did they buy it? Not at first. Then I told them we'd only wait a little while and get back into our positions on top. And did they buy it? Captain Carey, B Company commander, did, and he sold it. Jackson, have you got a watch? Yes, sir. Set it for exactly 0315. That's the time I've got. You too, Sergeant Klein. Now, both companies will move down the slopes at 0400. Jackson, you take off now. And start Hepzibah going at 0430. Have you got that? Well, yes, sir. I'm on my way. Right. Hold it. Huh? Jackson, come back. I'm fixing to, Sarge. He's a brave kid. He'll be right in the middle of that flying steel. Sir, this may sound goofy. But I feel that there's three of them going down into that drawer. Corporal Jackson, Hepzibah, and great-grandpappy. We readied the company. The lieutenant went down the slopes and picked out positions, though I didn't know how he found the strength to even stand up. The time went by slowly. Like it always does when you're tense and jumpy. At 03.30, I got the shakes. I wondered how Jackson was doing, if he'd found good cover. Five minutes to four, the lieutenant came back, dragging himself almost. Well, the boys are alert. I was challenged eight times. Sergeant, it'll be a shooting gallery if it works. 
It's a line of rocks in the right place. You be sure we have enough flares. I'll give the signal. B Company will wait until we fire the first flare. Fifteen minutes to go, Lieutenant. Stretch out, sir. Then it was 0400 and we went down the slopes, all except for a few men of security on top. I prayed, and I'm sure that the lieutenant did, that the commies wouldn't think that time to attack. They didn't. At 0430, we were in position, looking into deep blackness, everybody ready. Then, Hepzibah sounded down ahead of us. They're coming. I heard a voice shout orders. They think we're down there. That's it right. worked. Here goes the first flare. Look at them. Thousands right down the draw. Hepzibah and Sergeant Jackson's the best one. Well, I have five minutes to get out there and take the march past with the colonel. This is a great moment for me. Another memory. Hey, Sergeant Klein. Sergeant Jackson. Master Sergeant Jackson. Well, where did you come from? That doesn't matter. Only I have a part in this here fuss. I got special permission to play Hepzibah. Hepzibah? Right. I'm sure great grandpappy would approve of this here second time. Come on. The whole regiment's waiting. Young men, if you're planning for military service, your Army recruiter is a good man to know. Only the Army offers you so many different ways to choose how you'll serve before enlistment. Your recruiter will show you how to pick your technical training, how to enter the branch of your choice, or even how to name your own overseas assignment. Visit your local Army recruiting station and find out what special deals are open to you. There's no obligation. Remember, you get choice, not chance, from your Army recruiter. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army. This is Ralph Rowland inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>